experiential learning um, that is offered uh, at the school that is just so important. Um, and I really valued that I was always able to get my hands dirty at my Wells College education and write a play and have my, my buddy Colin um, helping with all the tech stuff and then directing. And I don't think you ever acted in one of my, no, you did act in one of my plays, Colin. It was like a reading, but yeah, you, you were, you were in there. Smell of summer. <laughs> and then, and then in the smell of summer, you acted in as well. I was thinking of this, it's, 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 a, it was a lot of plays. It was a lot of plays. And, you know, and that's honestly like where I learned one of the most important lessons that have sort of carried me through New York City these last 10 years is just the importance of community. Like, you know, I was, I was, and how making art with your community and servicing your community is just so important. Like Colin and I are so close and maybe not, maybe because of the first few weeks of freshman year, but because we put on a play together and, you know, that, that formed a huge bond. And thank God I got to know Jess really well when I was an RA and then they got married and it was amazing. That was a lot of stuff happened between that, but that's another talk back. Um, so, but that was, that was sort of the thing that I, I loved at, at Wells. And when I left Wells, that was sort of my, my, um, uh, that, that, that was sort of how I conducted myself in the theater world. Oh yes, we did win the Entrepreneur Award, Colin, which was in was just me having a really dumb idea, but Colin actually wanted to make it reality. So, you know, it really worked out. It was the flushable diaper. We called it the flushy. Billion dollar idea. Someone can never get it to work. Anyway, so, <laughs> um, the, uh, so you know, in going to New York City, that was sort of how I, I conducted myself in theater is I just try, I found my community very early on. I was uh, lucky enough that I was, I did a like in a summer intensive thing with some really great actors and writers that were living in New York and befriended them. And then just sort of like whenever I would write a play, just like when I was at Wells, I would invite my friends over for, uh, I would buy pizza and beer and just have them read the play out loud so I can hear the play out loud. Cause when you're doing any kind of play, that involves dialogue, the ear is just so important and being able to just hear people do it is so important. And then, you know, you end up writing for people that you love in your life uh, that just know your work so well that you have a little shorthand with so well. Like there's an actor, and anyone watch Orange is the New Black in the room by any chance? Anyone watch that show? There we are, okay. So if you have watched that show, did you ever get to that prison? Uh, the, 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 well, it's all in a prison, obviously. But you ever get that season where there's the, 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 the prisoners take over the prison and they have all the guards? And so one of my best friends on the planet played one of the guards in Orange is the New Black. He has a very famous strip tease that he does in the Lynchfield's Got Talent section. I don't know if any of you guys remember that. We were all very, I helped him train for that. Not with the stripping, but we all <laughs> ran, we ran together every morning to help get him in shape for it uh, because it was his first nudity. But anyway, that is someone that I've written so many plays for and he's been in most of my plays in New York City. And, and that's the kind of the community that you kind of, you come up with and I've never had an opportunity in my life that didn't in some way by extension come from that community and so because of that I was always just well, writing for my friends having we all scrounge together some money get a terrible black box theater in a part of town no one wants to go to and uh put um, put the play out there in front of an audience and that's just sort of what I did for almost a decade um but then you know people start to show up to things and you start to make better connections, apply to certain things and you get better opportunities. And right before the pandemic started, I had a play at uh, La Mama, which is a very old off-Broadway theater and the Cherry Lane, which is also an older off-Broadway theater. And that was just, again, all just from that sort of community sort of stuff. And one of those plays got me into Juilliard, which then kind of put me in a completely different place of creating work. And then that place is just, insane you have to write three full length plays a school year which is just way too many plays uh, but uh, you learn a lot about yourself in doing that and you know one of the best pieces of advice I ever got as a as a creative and I think this is a piece of advice that really 
uh, that transcends any medium. And you know, I'm sure uh, Colin can back me up at this in the PhD program in Cornell, or you know, uh, or Jess, and you know the the healthcare uh, work that she does. You know, you always you you, you never want to be the the smartest person in the room. You know, you're not going to learn anything. You know, the best room you can ever be in is where you're quote unquote, the dumbest person, because then you're actually gonna have to rise to the occasion. You're going to learn from so many people so that you can really get to that next level. And, you know, that's, I think that's, and when it comes to art, that's a very hard thing to do because there's so much ego involved because a lot of it is so personal. Uh, and it's, you know, when you start doing a creative process, it's, um, it can be very, uh, you know, you, 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 if you have any natural ability, you can, your ego can go really high and you can really think, you know, you're the next best thing because all you see are these young people that just explode onto a scene or whatever. And you just like, I want to be that person. What, I'm 23 and I'm not super successful? That's bullshit. I should be really successful by now. And that's not how it works. And then you, and then you get, you then, you know, you have a little bit of early success, but then you just get beaten down and beaten down and beaten down and beaten down. And then you kind of get to this place where it gets very hard to create work because it's really easy when you first start out because you don't know what you're doing and you're not your own. And you're, you don't know how to edit what you're doing and you don't know how to censor what you're doing in terms of like quality. And then you start to get a little bit good at it. And then you're just like, this is terrible. This is terrible. And it's just hard to move forward. Um, and then you get to this really this place where it's like, do I keep doing this? Am I any good? I, you know, I'm not getting anywhere with this. And then I, you know, and then you either make the decision to quit or you make a decision to commit to your craft um, and just focus on what it takes to actually do good work. Just try to remove ego from all of it. And for me, that was like just trying to create a play that works, a, a play that, that, that does everything that a play needs to do that I can be proud of and just committing to those words and that text and not worrying about any kind of rejection or not worrying about any kind of success, just like at the bare minimum, do my job. And then there's an, and then if you do that and you focus on that and it can take a very long time and it's, it's still taking me a very long time. You get to this place where it's not an ego, but it's a confidence a uh, kind of like a, a carpenter who knows who's like you know and, and I that sounds really silly because I don't know how to fucking make anything I'm so useless when it comes to two tools Colin Jess and my mom can tell you that um really good at calling the guy great at calling the guy I always get discounts but I I, I don't know a wrench from a screwdriver anyway um but to just to back it up though is that you know you want to get to a place artistically at least in my opinion where you have the confidence that you know how to do what you know how to do. And that's different than a confidence of being the best. So like I, when it comes to writing a play, I see myself a lot like a carpenter that like, like I, that knows how to make a chair. Like that chair works, that chair is gonna last. If you sit in that chair, it won't break and it'll look pretty decent in the room. And if someone commissioned you to write it, so not write a chair, but make a chair, you can make it to the dimensions and the sizes and to the look they wanna do. And, and is it the, or is that carpenter the best at making chairs in the world? God, no, but that carpenter knows how to make a decent chair. And that's sort of where I think every artist should strive to be artistically with their own work. Like I know how to make a play. I know how to make a play that works. And I know how to play, make a play that, that, that is, that, that can service whatever the sort of job it is. And it's by no means the best play, but I, I know how to do it. And I think that's an important confidence to get to when you furnish your craft. It's a lot of talking. <laughs> um, all that to say is, you know, that's sort of been my journey up until this point. And then getting into Juilliard, you know, that uh, that opens a lot of doors for you when it comes to sort of the film and TV side of things. And I've been uh, st step putting my toes into that a lot more recently. Um, and uh, working on you know, trying to get potential screenwriting jobs, either making new things based on some sort of uh, IP or intellectual property like book, article, what have you, or you know, adapting a TV show or get, trying to get staffed on a TV show. So I've also been working in that world as well a little bit, uh, but I'm still new to, I'm very new to that section, but I do know about it. 
but I also know, but, but, you know, feeder is kind of where I've been coming up and doing all the things I've been doing. That whole long preamble, and I really apologize for all the ranting, although I guess we are here to hear me talk, so it's not that bad, but um, I would really, I, you know, it's when they asked me to do this thing, I, at first I thought it was something that was, it was going to be for students. So I'm like, oh, I can do like playwriting 101. And apparently students don't really go to this. So I would love to know like you amazing Wells alums, what, what are you, what, what made you want to come to this event? Um, and what are you, what do you want to learn about the theater, film and TV side of things? And, you know, it's just so I, I would love to speak on those sort of things. Like, so maybe if we could just go around and I could just learn a little, you know, maybe you'd say name, class, you know, and what made you want to want to come here? Um, so I can start with my mom because I think the answer is just watch her son talk at a Wells thing. But if you want to just uh, talk, get yourself out of the way there. You want to introduce yourself, mom? Yes. <laughs> I'm an odd line. So, you know, I was a little disappointed that he was an even, but you know, that goes with the territory. <laughs> um, <laughs> but um, I, I know I, I was very grateful. Well, I was not grateful, but I was really, um, uh, what's the word? I was proud that he wanted to come to Wells. Um, he was born in California. You know, he grew up in California. And, and I said to him, well, you can't apply to Wells until you see the place because it's very different from where you've been. So we went out there in the summer before your senior year, I believe. And um, I had arranged ahead of time to um, let us have dinner with uh, Clugston at the Fargo. Oh, God. Um, <laughs> he's my was my favorite teacher and I wasn't even an English major. Um, but we and I said to him, Alex has to, to, you know, can you give him a tutorial on Hamlet? Because uh, he has to, you know, turn that in when school starts in a week, you know. So um, I thought that was pretty cool that uh, he, of course, being a Wells professor, no problem, went right ahead with it, gave him a tutorial on, uh, on Hamlet. And that was probably one of the defining moments of your you know, where am I going to go to school? Because yeah, I think that really, and, that yeah, really helped. That, yeah. was my, that was my first Wells lecture. It was in the back of the park. <laughs> That's right. there, there's At a more the fitting park. place to have it. More <laughs> fitting place to have it. But thanks yep. so much for introducing yourself, Ma. Uh, it, so please, I'd love to hear from everyone, you know, name, class, your affiliation to Wells and uh, and why you wanted to come here. And then uh, Mark, please. All right. I'll speak up. I'm the class of 1967, maybe the oldest person here. In any event, I have a school classmate whose name is Tandy Cronin. You may recognize it a bit. Her mother was Jessica Tandy. Her father was Yoon Cronin. Uh, and for me, Tandy's a very special person. Uh, we had a Zoom meeting uh, 10 days ago and uh, with other classmates. And she's very discouraged because she's not been able to be on the stage for the last two months, uh, two years, um, very depressed. She's uh, been hunkering down in New York City because of COVID. She's pleased to have recorded a couple of audio books. Um, and I'm just wondering, Alex, if you have any thoughts about the future of theater in New York City with all that is going on. So, sure. and I wish you the best. Thank you so much. I have that down. I'm definitely gonna talk about that. I got opinions. Uh, and then awesome, uh, Professor Vodder. Hi, am I unmuted? You're great. Uh, I just heard your great. mom and uh, mentioning about your introduction to Wells. I don't know your mom, or at least we've never met personally, I think, but I've, met you a number of times, most memorably yeah. on one of the uh, January trips for London Theater oh, uh, right. with Alan and we were all together. Uh, Scott Heinekamp and I accompanied Alan for, I think, oh, I don't know, okay. seven or eight years uh, wow. to his flat in London to watch his, uh, to, to participate in the London Theater thing. Uh, and uh, he was just here. Uh, and I, uh, I inter with Scott Heinekamp, and I uh, had raised the issue with him 
Uh, he's 93. He's completely non-technological. <laughs> so <laughs> even communicating with him uh, is difficult except by telephone. And he's also hard of hearing. So even doing that <laughs> is difficult. But he's still the same old Alan. And uh, I'm sure he'd want me to send you his warmest regards and to remind you that uh, you probably have his telephone number. Uh, you can call him up. And certainly if you're ever in Aurora, uh, Absolutely. Well, go by to visit a couple of months for reunion and i'm going to bring him a bottle of scotch so oh maybe <laughs> i'll make sure i'm there then <laughs> you, better. you and i uh, uh, good luck alex thank you so much uh, uh, deb what were what, tell me just about yourself really quick and of you're, course you're looking to learn from this whole thing of course so i um graduated from wells in 78 i um i'm just kind of curious because i live in central new jersey and i've spent um the last oh, 10 or so years working at, well, two two regional theaters, but one is a two-time Tony Award winning theater, the artistic director, and they, they produce their plays. At least they did. The artistic director retired after 30 years. And I'm sure you, you uh, know. What it is. theater is it, Deb? It's McCarter Theater in Princeton. Okay. And Emily Mann was the artistic director. Oh. Um, and um, really Great. prided themselves, herself, on new works, um, but also the combination of classics as well. So I've had a subscription there for ever. Pandemic comes, and of course, like the previous um, um, guest mentioned, her friend, not, not so much work. So my, my question, my thought really is what the theater is now turned into, and I see this now in our New Jersey, but also the New York ones that I have friends working in, that there's been a shift from this pandemic to doing new works by new and underrepresented women and people of color. Sure. And it's so much, at least where I am now, that it's totally abandoned a anything else. And I'm curious if that's unique to McCarter or what you may be encountering as you're trying to still do your plays at some different types of theaters in sure. New York or, or beyond. Sure, absolutely. I can definitely chat on uh, chat on that. Um, and uh, I don't know as much about regional theater as I do about theater in New York City, but I, sure. uh, I can definitely uh, talk, chat about as well, much as I can. And all of the McCarter things were all um, equity, the uh, oh, yeah, collaborators, the um, artists are yeah, people yeah, that you yeah. would see in all of your Oh, absolutely. Work. My 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 one of the most important mentors in my life is the artistic director and founder of the Farm Theater. He's directed a lot at the McCarter. So Okay. Uh, I, so I, you know I, what I'm talking. Very aware of the theater. It's a great theater. Right. Uh awesome. Uh well, uh whoever uh is uh, I guess uh, uh Randy, why don't you tell it's a uh, Actually, two of us are here. Uh, Randy's just sitting off camera. Oh, um, right, right, right. Because the, right. the, the, the his the... question had to do with um, where do you get the inspiration for your works? Um, sure. And uh, I also was very active in the theater when I was at Wells working under Nancy Wynn, um, okay. who then pushed me on to Barbara Dick Dickinson because she figured out I could dance. Um, but uh, you mentioned getting a play to do what it needs to do. And sure. I want to ask you, what does a play need to do, in your opinion? What does a play need to do? I really talk, I really walk myself into a corner with that one. <laughs> <laughs> you got it. <laughs> You're talking to Wells, folks. <laughs> very true. Tough very crowd. <laughs> um, Betty, what, 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 would, what would you be interested in me focusing on? Hi, I'm I'm class of 77, so I had to bring the odds into um, this a, a little bit. Um, and I've I've actually recently moved back into the area and I'm trying to kind of reconnect with Wells a little bit um, more. Um, I, I was married for a while to um, uh, Gautam Dasgupta, who's a, a, a theater instructor uh, professor at Skidmore. Oh, wow. And, and so met um, um, met some theater students, really enjoyed the black box, especially uh, performances by the, by the students. Um, and so just um, have a love for that, um, that amazing creativity. So uh, no real questions, just here to really listen. Thanks. Okay. Awesome, great. And, uh, and, and uh, Una, sorry, best for last. And then I'll ask Jess. Yes, really, um, Jess. You're, you're, too, <laughs> you're too kind, Alex. 
Um, I just really, uh, I don't have any questions, but I did want to say a couple of things. Uh, first off, that you should watch for this upcoming issue of Wells Notes, which should be coming uh -huh. out the first week of May, because there's a write-up in it on Alex um, and, and his work. Um, I've got a lot of background. That's why I don't have questions, because I interviewed him. It was a lot of fun. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm here tonight because it's my job. This is one of the more joyful aspects of what I do. I, I just really love you know, this Learning by the Lake series, it's a lot of fun. Um, and I do have um, I do have a request for you though, Alex. Uh, sure. I, think, I think that you need to come back to Wells as the world reopens post pandemic and um, and produce or direct a play on the FIP stage. I would, I would happily do that. I would happily do that. Whoever's in charge of theater, just tell them to reach out to me. We need you to do that. <laughs> happily. Uh, Jess, what do you, what do you, what do you want to say? Uh, my name is Jess. Most people at Wells call me Turtle. Um, I can totally relate to Alex's mom. Um, our daughter's name is Aurora. And she, if she went to college in the traditional timeline, she would be an odd liner. So tough. <laughs> um, but anyway, um, Alex, you were talking about um, adapting like books to TV or movies. I know that uh, fans, especially in um, like series of books tend to get pretty attached to the details yeah. of, of things. So what do you think is important to keep in? And, you know, like how do you make that balance of keeping this, you know, true to the story, but also being able, <laughs> being yeah. able to, uh, you know, fit the time? Yeah, absolutely. That's a great question. Um, okay, well, is there any other, would you, anyone like uh, uh, type anything in or anything like that? Awesome, great. Well, you know what? I, I'm i gonna do Jess's question first because everything else was very theater related. And I feel like I can kind of cover those while I'm like talking about that sort of stuff. But then like, you know, with, with Jess's question, you know, I'm still in my sea legs on it. Um, and I'm actually, uh, and I, I'm actually, I'm, a, I'm big on trying to be as faithful to the thing I'm adapting as humanly possible, depending on what it is. Um, you know, I've, I've the two things I've, the, there's three things I've had to, I've had to pitch and adapt. And so like, when it comes to film and TV, the last thing you do is right. Most of the, what, normally you're just doing an endless series of pitching film and TV executives what your take on a certain story is, why your take is the best take and all that sort of fun stuff. And, you know, I've, I've, I've gotten, you know, it's like you can do like five meetings where you even need the creator of the thing. And then you got to pitch them why your take on the thing that they wrote is better for that sort of stuff. So I've done it like three times and like the, the least adapty thing I did on it was, uh, was an article about a funeral that went really out of hand in Dublin. It was like a petty crook that was like infamous in the neighborhood and he died doing a robbery while he was on the lam from prison. And then for his funeral, all his friends like stormed the church, took over from the clergy and just like created this like rambunctious, debaucherous, booze and drug fueled, like just extravaganza of a funeral that just horrified the clergy and just like, just destroyed the church. And I had this film executive that I had a meeting with say, we've been really wanting to turn this into a movie. How would you do this? And like in that scenario, I was like, this is a really good, um, this is a great scene and it's a great climax, but it's not a movie. But I was like, if I was going to do a movie, I would be really interested in investigating what led up to this event and what is sort of the falling action from that event. Uh, and that was a thing that I was really interested in. And then I, but then also, because I, it's, you know, I, we wanted it to just be really just, and also I did, but the other thing is like, I'm a servant of whoever has the rights to the thing. And what, you know, so I have to ask them, like, what's the kind of movie you want to tell? And so, you know, they really wanted to do sort of like a crime thriller sort of thing. And so I ended up creating some, you know, having it set in my neighborhood in Washington Heights, a very 
fictitious sort of robbery gone wrong where this guy died and you know his friends um have these diamonds and uh they're trying to get through this funeral and mourn their friend and leader and also someone that they some of them have complicated relationship to and they also want to try to find a way to get rid of these diamonds and get out of there uh alive and so you know it's this sort of like ensemble like crime thriller uh thing and you know at the end of the day i did service capturing this funeral because I did build to something that was essentially that, but I was able to put it in another story, one that I was really passionate about telling because it was very much about friendship and the kind of relationships that last for a long time and then some of the ones that don't that aren't serving you anymore and coming to terms with those relationships sort of falling apart or then finding the, the relationships that are really important and also seeing that, that, you know, that ambition might not be the most important thing. Maybe it's staying true to your roots. So I was like covering all these things that are really important to me while also trying to serve that adaptation. You know, someone asked, you know, what is, uh, what, what's the inspiration for work? And for me, the most important thing at the end of the day is I have to write about what keeps me up at night. What are things that I am dealing with? And, and it can be very specific and autobiographical, but it can also be very, it can just, it can be emotionally autobiographical, which is a term I steal from Tennessee Williams, uh, where, you know, it's like, I gotta put something in the piece that I'm dealing with so I can connect to it emotionally. And that can be like a, a very heady dramatic play, or it can be a crime thriller that's a little funny and weird and like this one. And, but at the end of the day, it always has that thing that's keeping me up at night that I insert into it. Um, and then there's sometimes, and then, you know, the other thing to think about just when you're adapting something is sort of like what works best for the medium that you're exploring. And because uh, the thing is, I actually took a class when I was at Wells. It wasn't at Wells. It was when I was studying abroad in Bath in the program they have there. And it was all about looking at um, these uh, post-World War II British novels and the films they inspired. So like as an example, reading 1984 and then watching that really weird adaptation that came out in 1984 with uh, uh, John Hurt. Uh, and uh, James, not James Mason, that's the, uh, uh, whatever. Anyway, so, uh, but um, I, I digress. And so it was all about sort of like, yes, you wanna serve that text, but you also wanna you know, know that you are making a movie and you want that movie to sort of be in conversation with what you're adapting. And you also want that to, to, you know, to when you're making a movie or making a TV show, like what is the medium gonna do best with that enhances the story? Um, and so you, do, you, so you really wanna look at it as medium by medium. And so like an example, I'm, I'm up for this potential job adapting a knob a horror novel from the 1930s and i, I won't say the novel because I, I haven't gotten the job and this is being recorded but um the the uh it's it's a horribly sexist book from especially in the beginning and at the end uh and it, it's basically it's this it's this uh this 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 uh this guy is a very important job and he finds out, and he has a lot of success, and he finds out and do that that the reason why he has all the success that he has is because his wife is a witch. And uh, she's been doing all this stuff behind the scenes and everyone else that works in his job, all their wives are witches too. And they're just behind the scenes pulling all these strings to service their husbands and their husbands' careers and stuff like that. And I and the and it's the it's, and it comes from the point of view of the man, and uh, it's and like the, the way that his internal monologue about stuff like some of it is just so problematic because it's from the 1930s. But who knows? This was probably really ahead of its time for feminism in the 1930s. But end of the day, I'm you know in in adapting this to be a movie. At first, I had to look at like well, one I. I when I was reading the book, hated the first part, horribly sexist, but then eventually the, the movie, the, sorry, the book, uh, it got really good when the husband ends up being possessed by this like evil force and he starts questioning his own reality and everything that's going on with him. And he, at first, he doesn't want to reach out to his wife 
for help because she's like made her burn all his her witch stuff and he's they now have no defenses against this thing it's a really weird book guys <laughs> but um if you text me later i can tell you the title but uh the the thing is that you know eventually he realizes that he's in trouble and he needs his wife's help and then it, it, it and it ends up being uh i realized in reading it and this is when it gets really thrilling this this book at its core is about a marriage that is seemingly perfect but it's not working because though the they're not being honest with each other the wife was hiding all of this witch stuff from him he was hiding other things in in his life as well and they're all hiding things not to be deceitful to hurt the other person they're doing it to protect the other person but in doing that they're not having a real they're having a bad marriage and so I think anyone can relate to like your, your relationships work best when you have open, honest communication with each other. So I realized that that was the core of what this thing was about. And then once this, this couple starts working together, they're able to overcome these evil forces. And I thought that was a cool story. And then it became super sexist in the end. But, and so I was, I, the whole reason I even got the opportunity for the job was just because I mentioned I grew up in the Silicon Valley and I worked in tech for a lot of my, uh, my, my twenties. And so they, they, they wanted to set it in the Silicon Valley. And so, uh, so again, Jess, like, I'm at the whim of my bosses that are like saying, this is how we want to adapt it. And so then what I looked at is like, well, what's the core thing that was so valuable in the book? And let me put that in tech. And I'm still taking the most important thing from the novel. And I was also looking like where it was set. It's set in academia, um, that it was all about these power dynamics that are often changing. Um, and I, the tech is actually a really good place for that. And so it's like, you just sort of take these core principles and then you just put it in something else. Does that kind of answer your question, Jess? Like kind of how you can adapt and stuff like that? Sorry, okay, <laughs> I'll do the other ones then. Um, uh, so future of theater in New York after COVID. I am a really optimistic person. <laughs> uh, I will preface that because I'm a, I'm a big, I'm a big fan of just focusing on, uh, you know, it's like if I have no control over the thing, I just try to hope for the best possible outcome. Um, you know, and you know, historically, there have been many plagues <laughs> that have happened. Theater is one of the oldest art forms in the world. I had a drama teacher in high school, like he tried, you, you, we, we came into class for like a theater history thing, and he was like you know, uh, doing it, trying to pretend like he was a, a prehistoric person communicating that there was a lion outside. And he's doing like this whole thing where he was pretending to be the lion and having someone else pretend to be this hunter and just sort of communicate that like before there was even language, there was theater. And so like theater is this, uh, this, this art form that I do not think will ever go away. And I think you know New York City is in, in is is adapting to this. It is it's 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 taken a while, but like there's all these Broadway shows that are happening right now that were that closed during the right before the pandemic or didn't get to happen because of the pandemic uh, that are now out. Like there's this and there's off Broadway shows like that too, like. Atlantic Theater Company, which is a company that I just very recently was fortunate enough to get a, a commission by, which is one of my favorite theater companies in New York. I'm not just saying that because they're paying me. Um, they were supposed to have a production of this musical written by actually a fellow Juilliard alum, uh, Josh Harmon. Oh, he did the book and then it's written by and adapted by uh, um, a, uh, a Sarah Silverman memoir called The Bed Bedwetter. And, you know, it's about her as a little kid and having that problem and stuff like that. And, and actually Adam Schlesinger did the music for it. He's from Fountains of Wayne. He was actually one of the first people to die from COVID in the United States. And so like, that's a really tragic production that was supposed to go up, COVID happened, and then everything shut down. But even that show is about to be in previews right now. And that show is about to open right now. So things are coming back. And there's a lot of protocols right now to make sure that it can come back. There's whole jobs that didn't even exist anymore. COVID safety officers, like we are adapting, we are trying to make it better. That said, um, one thing that I know will come back, but it's something that's not, it's, that's a little slower 
because it's, it is indie theater, which is the kind of theater that I came up doing. That type of theater is, have, is, is struggling to come back at the same, at the same velocity because it's, it costs a lot of money to do all these COVID procedures, to do all this testing and have all these certain special people in place. And like indie theater, that's like, that's people just like throwing some stuff together and making it work. It's very like, you know, uh, Shakespearean like back in the day, you know? Uh, that was- And there's huge them. audiences though for that. People love to see new works. Yes, and the thing is, in new works are definitely done in that indie theater level, but all the off Broadway and the Broadway houses are do, do new work too. Right. It's just right. um, before you get to that level where you're being produced at that level, and I, I still have never been produced at that level. All, even my stuff in those off Broadway houses, like the Cherry Lane or La Mama, mm -hmm. I was in their like studio space, and it was still an independent production, but it, like had a little bit more prestige to it. Um, but I, you know, I have I've yet to be produced at the off Broadway level. And but you know and there's a lot and but you know off broadway that's kind of like and that's um that's where a lot of like pulitzer prize winning plays and stuff come mm -hmm. from and so like they have the budgets to do all this COVID stuff but indie theater not as much and so it's a little that part is coming back slower but it is coming back i mean i was just did a thing last week watching a friend of mine's play in the jane ballroom and they were using a balcony was there and they were just like doing a fun little reading thing so it, it is coming back and you know with every you know with this last omicron wave a lot of stuff shut down i had a, i had something that was going up that got shut down but then they got rescheduled and moving forward and so you know it is it's coming back it's just taking a little bit of time but it's you know people love theater it's very resilient you know it's uh but you know the theaters are struggling with it um so yeah um and then the there was a question about you know focus on uh new work and women and people of color um i mean that is a huge that that is i mean that it's the thing is like for very 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 long time i don't have enough varies i mean all theater kind of being done uh and a lot of art is just like you know white dudes uh and so there's a huge there's a you know and thankfully there's a huge um uh mandate and push from a lot of uh from from theaters especially in like new york chicago and la to really try to like widen that net and produce folks um that don't normally have a voice right and it's a it's just a very very important thing right now and it's a really great important thing and you know honestly it's pushed me to write about things that i ne necessarily never wrote about like i'm 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 half egyptian and I, the last few plays that I've been writing have been focusing on that part of my of, of, of how of, of my culture. And, you know, it was stuff that I was always very afraid to write about because, you know, I didn't I didn't feel as you know, we're not, you know, the Middle Eastern culture is not a monolith. You know, it's it's and I did never felt comfortable representing uh, other, other people in that community. But then, you know, you tell very personal stories sometimes and it helps makes it easier to sort of talk about that kind of thing and it's funny enough the more specific you are the, the more universal it is uh you know i'm and i'm about to have i'm about to have a reading of this play that i wrote about this road trip i took with a couple of my egyptian cousins to go see this aunt before she uh passed away and it's like this hyper 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 specific kind of moment in time and play and about these very specific people and i just got the note yesterday from the people who went on, I was like, wow this is just like you know this is very specific but i'm just getting so many things about my life and all this sort of stuff and so it's like the other thing is like the the these kind of works about these types of people and cultures and stuff like that it actually ends up getting to some pretty universal themes but then like talk about like the you know the mccarter and other sort of of, of theaters of that cloud you know a, a lot a, a lot of them get a lot of their plays from the stuff that's being done off Broadway and on Broadway in New York City. So, you know, if they're doing those sort of things, it is gonna trickle down to the region, right, right, right. which is great. Um, and uh, and so it's it's just, it's it's the time we're in right now to sort of compensate for how 
terrible things have been for representation before. Mm -hmm. uh, so it, it's a it's a great thing that that's happening, and and it's and you know it also will mean that maybe they'll explore even older work that might have been a little more specific that wasn't given yeah. that before too, which is really cool as well. Uh, so yeah, I don't know if that kind of answer your. Oh, question. fabulous! Thank you, thank you, thank you. Best wishes. This is great. Thank you. Okay, awesome, great. Um, so I kind of covered like you know inspiration you know for work and everything like that um and uh so because you know it's like i said right about what keeps you up at night so it has a soul um but uh and then you know what does a play need to do <laughs> that's the question i'm putting off this whole time <laughs> um you know at, at the at the end it from for for you know to go like really broad and this is like something that a you know, the, one of my one of my favorite professors at Wells uh, was uh, uh, Professor uh, Catherine Burroughs, and that was the and that was she was the toughest professor I probably ever had to like one of the things that I really uh, that I still I will I will I will care I will the rest of my life one of the things I'm most proud of is the fact that I got an A plus in her 300 level dramatic literature class like that was just like no one else outside of Wells would care about that but <laughs> that, that was really hard to get but she when she would talk about Keats uh, in her um, British literature course um she she there's a there's a series of letters that Keats is uh is exchanging with another romantic writer and it was something about it was like the lamp in the mirror I feel like that's what it was I forget exact but to paraphrase it basically what Keats said about art is that it's supposed to be shining a light and also reflecting back and so for me when it comes to theater I'm I there's there's a lot of different ways to make a play. I'm pretty naturalistic in how I write. I, I'm the, the weirdest thing I ever did was have a bunch of talking parrots that are holding on to trauma from this guy's past life that are like taunting him, but still like parrots do hold on to trauma and parrot out trauma. So, you know, but it's like he's having a conversation with his mom, but he's not. Um, but it's but that's like the weirdest I've ever gotten. But for the most part, I'm very naturalistic. Writers and, uh, in, on Broadway, what was that? On, on television and the movies. So what was that, uh, Professor Oh, sorry. Um, so the um, so I'm not particularly weird, uh, but you can be really weird. And like one of my favorite, uh, one of my favorite playwrights that's a that's a that's a contemporary of me. Like he has this weird play called Creative Day, which is about this guy that like creates a robot to like uh, to like do stuff around the house and the robot ends up being gay and like, you know, helping out. It's like a really weird, weird, weird play. I'm not even describing it properly, but anyway, I digress. At the end of the day, whether it's a strange play or an, a naturalistic play, I'm all about, I think it's really important to capture authenticity and truth in any kind of moment, but then to bring it to the Keats thing, this is very, I should have just stuck with the Keats thing. Uh, I think a play should be putting a mirror up into the audience and the audience in watching something, they're able to have uh, a catharsis and like a, a, a relate to something that's going on in the stage in some capacity or think about some conflict that's going on in their life or some something that they're struggling with their own life and just kind of help them deal with it. To like give an example of something I, I did not write, which was Death of a Salesman, which is one of my all-time favorite plays. Um, and I'm sorry, Mom, I'm going to talk about you for just a second. Um, I saw, I was lucky enough to get to see uh, uh, Philip Seymour Hoffman do that, the, that that Broadway production of Death of a Salesman, with Andrew Garfield actually playing his son before, Biff, before he was famous. And uh, that was, to this day, still the greatest theatrical experience of my life. Um, and up until that, and up, up until seeing that play, so my, my parents had a small business for 25 years. And uh, when I went to go see Death of a Salesman, it was the week they were actually closing their business, 
which was um, through, it was the Great Recession and these corporate interests were really screwing their franchisees. Uh, so it was really, it was very hard for me to watch my parents, you know, have to close their business. But I hadn't dealt with it emotionally yet. It was just sort of happening while I was finishing out Wells and I was in New York City watching this production of Death of a Salesman. And uh, when Willie Loman said, you can't eat the orange and throw away the peel, a man's not a piece of fruit, I lost it. And I just bawled crying. Because in watching, you know, Willie Loman on this stage, I mean, Bill Hoffman do that scene just magic, masterfully, I was seeing my parents on that stage and like seeing like what, what had happened to them and their business and their American dream and stuff like that. And so I, that I, in watching this play, I was actually able to deal with my own trauma and sadness and everything. And I walked out of the theater, I texted both my parents and told them I love them, which were raised a lot of red flags. Like they were worried about me. I was like, no, I just saw the death of a salesman. And I like, you know, had a hefty scotch afterwards. And I might've like tripped on some subway stairs because I was still so fucked up and from that whole experience. And at the end of the day, that's what a play has to do. It has to connect to your audience emotionally. It's a real fucking cop out of an answer because there's a lot of technical things I can talk about about what makes a play a play. But uh, that, at the end of the day, I think that is that's the most important thing to do. Did, uh, did, uh, did that answer the, 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 the question and everything that you were asking? Awesome. Awesome. Uh, well, we have 10 more minutes left. What else would you guys like want me to talk about or any other questions I can answer or ramble about or all that sort of stuff? So, so Alex, you talked a little bit about um, some of your Wells experiences like with Catherine Burroughs in terms of the class there. I, I'm curious in terms of your Wells experience in terms of classes that were not sort of in, in theater in English that had effect on you sure sure um this is gonna have this 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 doesn't you know yeah sure so i actually if i were to if i were to do my wells experience over again i would not double major in english and theater not because i don't want to study those things i probably still would have taken all those same classes but my priorities were all fucked up my, I only said fuck three times. I'm pretty proud of that. I'm normally way more vulgar if you know me. Anyway, so uh, because I had this priority, it's like I need to get good grades because I want to have some sort of that because that'll lead to some kind of success. And I was like, I so I just ended up taking classes and majoring in things that like were with what I wanted to do as a career and what I was uh, what I was already very good at and knew about. And it was really helpful to my theater career that I know that thing about Keats and all that sort of stuff. But, you know, being a double major in English and theater, like, was not very good for my liberal arts education because that meant I literally was only taking English or a theater class generally. Although in my defense, I was pressured into doing that by uh, my advisor, Professor Linda Lawn. Shout out to Professor Lawn. That's that's very much for you, Colin. And I love Professor Lawn with all my heart. She told me to do it. She's like, I wanted to be an individualized major in playwriting, which essentially would have been doing the same thing. And she's like, don't be fucking lazy, just double major. But anyway, so I pull back. Uh, what I, to answer your question, <laughs> Dean Speaker, uh, you know, I, I wish I had, I wish I had majored in, in some, in art history, which is something I knew nothing about. I took an art history class because I had to with my major, my senior year, and I loved it. Uh, Professor Gannis was one of the coolest teachers I ever had. I and mean, when he was talking about Andy Warhol and the Velvet Underground, that was just incredible. Uh, and I was just like, man, I'm learning a subject I know zero about, and this is so interesting. And it still informs stuff that I do today, not just because of my Velvet Underground vinyl collection. But the, um, but the other thing is like, I wish I had taken a ton of classes that I was really bad at that because then I would have learned even more and I but I was afraid to take because I didn't want to get a bad grade uh so I guess what I'm trying to say is get rid of grades at Wells but no it's like I wish I took more science classes with Colin and Jess or I took more you know psychology classes with Jess you know it was just sort of like 
I, I, I really wish that I had cared more about learning and the craft of learning, much like I was talking about caring about the craft of writing a play than I was about the ego of graduating, you know, magna cum laude and stuff like that. Because uh, at the end of the day, you go out in the real world, no one cares. <laughs> you know, it's just, you know, you want to just be a smart, well-rounded person. It's like whenever I, I meet a student, it's like, what advice do you have when you go to college? I'm like, just graduate and learn as much as you can, you know? And so, but those, uh, so I didn't take as many of those other classes as I wish I had. But, you know, I, I, um, I did build a sailboat with some of my friends once. I remember that. <laughs> No, great answer. Thanks. That connected me to the old man, Cindy. I guess, in a lot of ways. So uh, I don't know if that really answers your question, Dean, no. sir, but it definitely does. It does. I mean, I, I, I think he sort of, you know, hi hindsight is twenty twenty, right? We all, you know, wish we would have done things a little bit differently had we know what the experiences might have brought us. But I think. Um, you also, you also did engage in lots of different things outside of English and theater as majors. Exactly. We totally do. But I did. I was one of those people that got dinged for taking too many classes in my major. <laughs> they have that 45 credit, credit hour. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Exactly. Uh, awesome. What other kind of questions can I answer for folks? I know we got five more minutes. Al, I've got a I've got a question if uh, if I could. Um, you had mentioned earlier about kind of that pivotal moment of either like choosing your craft or like saying this isn't working. Do you like, have you ever had that moment or like, what was that moment or like, what was your like low point? Like maybe theater writing or playwriting is not for me. Yeah. I mean, I, yeah, I had that moment for a very long time. <laughs> You know, it's just like, uh, it's, it's a hard one to sort of uh, um, really um, pinpoint because it's, it's, it's not like, at least for me, it wasn't like a specific aha, like I have to do this or this sort of crossroads moment, but it was just like, you know, you come to this, came to the city, I was, you know, you know, you're, you know, 22 years, 21, actually, I moved to the city, you know, it's, uh, you know, just having like little, little, little success here and there, but like, and then just like keep applying to things or just go, going into certain rooms and then just like, just keep getting just beaten down and then like, you know, doing, you know, a couple you know, it's like I had a couple of productions early on that did that were that were that I was really happy about and that people did seem to really respond to. But I think there was like, I think there was this like one point where I was like, there was this one play I was working on and worked on it for a very long time. And I kept trying to make it better and I kept applying to it things. And I just kept getting rejection after rejection after rejection. And I just and I just didn't see like a path forward. And it's uh and I, you know, I and I just sort of was like, eventually I was like, well, I'm just gonna have to write another play and just focus on writing about those things that were really messing with me at the time. Uh, it was this play I wrote called The Floor is Lava. And that's not even a play that I particularly love that much, but that was a play that helped get me through that period and helped get me to talk about those things that I was really stressed about and that I was dealing with and that play is all about failure and about being at this rock bottom as a person as a failure and then what and being around these people that are really successful and that you were supposed to be the successful one and then how do you deal with that and I learned a lot in writing that play and rewriting that play over and over and over again and I mean a small production that play that was that you know I wish was better uh but then I did get another production that I really really liked um and uh so the and then, but I learned from that play, things that I brought on to the next play I wrote, which was called The Wild Parrots of Campbell. And, and that's the one that ended up getting me into Juilliard. But it was just basically, it's like, you know, there's this, there's a great movie that is so accurate to the writing process that was just on Netflix, still on Netflix called Tick, Tick, Boom. Anyone seen that? It's really, really, really good. And basically that whole movie, I'm going to give a spoiler, mute me or mute the computer. I'm going to give you a little spoiler alert, but he's just trying to get this one play to work and have this one thing of success. And at the end of the day, it's like, well, we'd really like to see the next one. 
<laughs> but he did learn so much and he had to like he's gonna do the next one and that was rent so you know it's just uh so it's like uh it, so it, it's that kind of like you just gotta you gotta take your licks and just not give up i mean i'm i'm a big proponent of the uh and i guess i'll leave you all with this uh that i really believe firmly that artistically everyone especially it, at least in the performing arts makes it uh but then a lot of people give up before they do you know there's a lot of examples of you know actors like alan rickman from harry potter that's for that's for definitely for colin on that one you know he didn't make it as he didn't get his first big role until he was in his 40s um and then like you know one of my a, a friend and mentor of mine ron cephas jones he's pretty he, he he didn't make it until he was in his 60s he was doing a lot of theater in new york city but he made it in the 60s being that show this is us and he got an emmy from that and now he has this explosive incredible uh film and tv career and he just kept with it kept working at it because you know a lot of people are going to give up around you and if you stick with it and you maintain your craft you 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 just get better and better and then you eventually someone's going to notice like success in my industry is all preparation meets opportunity and you just got to keep preparing keep preparing until that one opportunity knocks and then you just have to show up and be there and knock it out of the park uh so that's that's sort of in my mentality and i hope it uh keeps working uh so you know i'm by no means where i oh uh, you know uh you know but I'm trying, I'm getting there. So I'll, I'll, that, that was a very intelligent way to end a talk. So my apologies. That's a great way to, to summarize, Alex. Appreciate that so much. Happy to help, happy to help. And I'm more than happy to talk to whatever students, if you guys ever wanna have me at Wells to talk to students or what have you, so. Oh, you know we, we'll take you up on that. <laughs> please do, please do. Uh, thank you so much, everyone. I, I'm a minute over. I'm always late and, and running over things, so I apologize. And, well, we don't care. <laughs> okay, perfect. Well, thank you all so much for coming. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Thank Alex. you very Thanks much. very much, and we'll see you soon. Yeah, absolutely. Later. Yes, you at reunion. <laughs> yeah, see ya. Bye. Okay, bye-bye, everyone. Bye, everyone. Thank you. It was great. Bye.